So are we on with the virtual squad board? Okay. Hello, everybody out there in the virtual world also. Um, I'm Karen Governor. I'm the CEO of the Star Building Foundation. Um, and I'd like to welcome everyone who's here in person and virtually for our family forum. Uh, Star Building not only provides um, innovative and life transforming programs for our participants, but we also offer them mm -hmm. of support for our families and uh, for our members. So, so we start off in the family forum series to, uh, to provide families with connections and valuable information um, that would point them to expert advice and resources. Uh, it's also a networking opportunity for families to meet within our community uh, to share experiences and, and resources as well. So we first started offering the forums in 2018. And since then, we've offered nine forums on relevant and current topics, including caregiver support, disaster preparedness, ABLE accounts, the Collier County Sheriff Office's Autism Support Project, and even more. Um, if you'd like any um, information about the past forums, uh, we'd be happy to share them. I think some of them are on our website. Um, do they go back to nine or how current are the ones on our website? Uh, they're all housed on our YouTube channel, which can be found on our website under Bit Forms. Excellent. So there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, we do have a YouTube channel. So. so we're very pleased to offer today's forum on guardianship and benefits, uh, benefits and guardianship. The, the order. Um, these areas have been covered in previous forums, but based on continued interest, we thought it was important to bring them back with a slightly different approach. Uh, so before we get started, I want to thank the Collier Community Foundation for hosting us in their beautiful room. A couple housekeeping items. We have restrooms out the door to the left, uh, right over in that way by the elevator. Um, uh, just we have a few refreshments in the back, so feel free to help yourself at any time. So if you're joining us virtually, uh, we're going to mute everyone's mics and so to avoid the background noise. So if you have any questions before, during, or after the presentation, please put them in the chat. So, and we're also recording as Lauren mentioned, so we'll share the link later on this week. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and everyone who contributes to making Star Ability the thriving organization that it is. So that includes our fabulous staff, team, our board members, our donors, our volunteers, and our community partners. A uh, special thank you to Lori Sullivan, who's our Director of Operations, and Rachel Diaromo, who is our Marketing Communications Director for providing the logistical planning and protection. <laughs> Just a little bit about Starbility. Our mission is to transform the lives of individuals, intellectual and developmental disabilities yeah. through social, vocational, and educational connections to the community, while also strengthening awareness for individual abilities. So we focus on shining a light on ability, not disability. So we serve over 300 participants, uh, both in person and online. And through our life enriching programs, such as our STAR Connections, our participants connect and engage with the community through continuing education, art, health and wellness classes, sports leagues, monthly socials, and more. Our pioneering outreach program, which we call the Trailblazer Academy, that offers community-based skill development experiences. And also we have a virtual Trailblazer Academy that enables our participants to stay connected near and far. So we've had people as far away as Canada participate in our virtual trailblazer academy. So we have close to 70 trailblazers, and we have another 70 people on the waiting list going today. So we have a junior trailblazer academy, which is I'm on the board right now, and it it's an after-school program for 14 to 22 year olds. I'm listening to yeah, and through our robust vocational services program, but uh, our participants learn job skills, career opportunities. And are assisted in finding. Oh, she starts the practices today. Yeah. We have a social enterprise that we call oh. our Star. Oh, okay. and our oh, okay. vocational training. That's okay. They learn to make uh, unique and okay. products that are sold throughout the community, such as our hand poured soy candles, which are our signature 
product, holiday ornaments, bracelets, and more. So they're beautifully handcrafted and along with donated upscale furniture and home decor, we sell them in the store. And as I mentioned, out in the community, our studio products, for instance, are sold at art fairs, such as the Naples Art Association's Fair on Fifth Avenue, at Camden Harvest and Mercado. So look for them in your own community. And finally, through our Thrive Ability Program, which is our community garden project, this was developed in collaboration with the City of Naples and River Park Community Center. And our participants enjoy therapeutic, recreational, inclusive, and vocational experiences as they learn about gardening and forage. So as you can see, we offer a variety of programs to meet the needs and interests of our participants. So we're very grateful and happy to welcome our two presenters who are joining us today. Adela Hernandez, who is an employment and disability consultant at IAS LLC. And Lisa Gotti, who is a partner at Woolman, that's right, Gerke and Associates, PA. And we're also pleased to have Nancy Ross, our individual academy plan specialist, and mother to Jake, who's a trailblazer, for joining us to share a parent's perspective during the QA portions of the presentations. <laughs> any other birthdays <laughs> So our first presenter is Idella Hernandez. And we're going to hear about benefits from Idella. So Idella is a human services professional who is committed to promoting meaningful changes in people's lives. She has over 20 years of experience in the field and holds a national certification in rehabilitation counseling, as well as a national certification in social security, benefits work and incentives advisor, <laughs> right? Yeah. Idella provides employment <clears throat> services and benefits work incentives advisement to individuals with disabilities and their families. So welcome, Idella. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Avery, for bringing me over here and for sharing a little bit of sharing a bit of my knowledge to the families of individuals with disabilities. So please, um, before I start sharing any information, I want to tell you guys that self security benefits is very complicated, as you might all know. And um, this is a kind of a joke. My sister came to work with me about seven years ago, and I remember that she always said, this is a spider web. I cannot take it anymore. Stop it and keep going. Maybe this continue next year <laughs> because it was so complicated. And if at some point you feel like no way, you don't feel bad. You know, mm -hmm. I will try my best to be simple, but there's no easy way to explain things in plain language. And it's just not my first one. It's a very language. So because today it requires that we keep the terminologies the way they are. And when we talk about technical language, it's very complicated. So I'll try my best to apply the simple English language to social security. And uh, another thing is, if you don't understand what I said, feel free to ask again. I don't take it personally. I understand it, okay? Um, we have an agenda today that will cover Several aspects that that Ms. Lori asked me to forward for you guys, and it might be a little broad, too much information, but I will try to to be more sensitive to you about that. Uh, first of all, we wanted to know about job security uh, benefits in the actual SSI and SSDI. Supplemental security income and uh, social security disability insurance. And a lot of people get confused with that. So we're going to talk about what is the difference, eligibility criteria for income, and uh, how to get it. Then we're going to talk about Medicaid versus Medicare, which is going to be more simpler because Medicaid is connected with SSI. And we'll talk about it. And Medicare is linked to SSDI. Uh, also, we have child disabled. That slide has a lot of micro there, disabled. 
this lesson for some reason. <laughs> and uh, that's the way that social security enables the uh, terminal child disabled benefits. And that is because under the parent record. Working of receiving SSI and SSDI, those are the working centers. So if you receiving benefits and you want to go to work, but you're afraid of losing one you had to struggle for five years to get in, then we're going to talk about some work incentives that are available so you can max out uh, benefits and earnings. At the end, we're going to talk a little bit about student and income exclusion because that's another type of work incentive that is specifically for students between the age of 18 to 24. Okay, so let's start with number one. The, essence, the definition of disability. Okay. Uh, that is that because the definition of disability is not what we think, it's what Social Security has in, in their definition. And that means that someone that is uh, over the age of 18 that is considered to be disabled, so if you have a medical, determinable uh, physical or mental impairment, that number one can be solved in death or can last for 12 years or more. So it's a permanent disability condition. So that's the definition that they have about disability. So some people might say, well, I have a disability, I have ADD, ADHD, but that's not considered to be an impairment for the body. And all this definition is basically directed to the ability to work on it. Okay. Yeah. Talking about SSI, supplemental security income. There's a lot of words there, but I'm going to make it simple saying number one, the person has to meet the criteria of disability. And number two, the person has to have little resources or limited resources, less than $2,000 in assets in any account combined. Checking or saving for things. Uh, at this point, some people might say, Well, my son is 19, but someone in the family passed away and left uh, an inheritance for him that is about $20,000. That is not going to be eligible for us at that. At that point, it's recommendable that the person looks for uh, state planning or special needs trust. To get that fund allocated in a special needs trust. So there is a, so take the savings account that will make SSI and eligibility come back. This is, uh, another thing is they have two different types of uh, disability definition one for the ones that are below the age of 18, minors, and another one for those that are older the age of 18. To apply for Social Security, anybody will have to call Social Security office and make an appointment. They can do the application over the phone or in person. We have to make that up. That's one option. Sometimes that's not the best option. And I, my suggestion is to gather the information that you need for that application first. Get some advice on how to navigate that account kind of process. And from there, you then call and get the application completed because they want to ask you questions that you have no idea. Then the application is going to stop because they cannot continue if they don't have that answer. So be prepared before you go to that route. Okay. I can help you with that. So, wrapping up here, uh, economic needs based SSI is just to supplement another income to help with food and shelter. So a lot of people say, but how is someone going to live with $700? They don't, they really don't care about that. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. The, the title, Title 16, has been developed only to supplement any other kind of income for food and shelter. It doesn't matter if you pay your child for the shoes, for the phone, for the haircut, but you never say, that you're paying for the food and shelter. 
as soon as you said I'm paying for food and shelter, boom, they do some amount of essence. Okay, so we're going to go there later. And that information is here. I hope that you guys have the, the, the handouts that they're watching so you can take note. So, again, the exercise that payment is intended uh, for children and any other kind of group. Uh, they want to be looking into your income and resources. You can make a certain amount of money that will never exceed double the amount of what they need. The, Standard SSI is, for example, if someone receives $500 on SSI and your earnings are $400, then your SSI is going to become zero. The good thing about SSI is that if you earn new work and you earn more than the double SSI amount, this is a multi calculation. It doesn't mean that your benefits are terminated that month. So next month, you don't make it to that level, you get your check again. <laughs> okay. So always, if you keep more than $2,000 in the bank, your SSI is going to be penalized, SSI and Medicaid for 12 months. Yes, sir? Uh, sorry, I'm just going back. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you said if the person's taking care of the child and let's say they're all they're getting social security and all that but if they say that they're taking care of uh the house and and the food they, they they're eliminated from some other benefit that they can apply for no 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 other benefit. i maybe um yeah no what i meant to say is an, an adult child that is living in your house, receiving SSI. When you go to South Security and you say that this person is not paying his fair share of housing and food, then they will reduce the SSI amount. SSI has two amounts. Yeah. One is the full amount, which is 910, 140, and the reduced amount about $600, kind of. That amount is reduced because the, the individual that is receiving SSI is not paying the fair share towards food and then food and shelter. So that's why when you have an adult child living with you and you go to social security saying, oh no, he doesn't pay rent because he, he doesn't have enough money, that affects the full amount or the reduced amount. We're gonna go to that later. I'm just kind of say myself a little bit there that okay. it is important for you to know that SSI is intended to supplement food and shelter. I want so to you're going to get less if you say, yeah, if they you can get afford it, the rent, you, get, you get less. Yes, absolutely, because SSI is supposed to supplement supplement food and shelter. If someone is not paying the fair share, that means that somebody else is helping. If somebody else is helping, the farms, then so that security doesn't have to pay the full amount. Got it. And you always think that it's the other way around. Right. And as soon as you say no, you know, pay, you lose an amount. How do we get <coughs> that? Kind of some tips for you. Well, he does have to pay because everybody has to pay the fair share. He doesn't have enough, but I have an I owe you log. And he has to pay me when he gets more money. But if you applied and you said that, can you retract it? In the beginning, when you apply, there's no way that you can change that. No. You're going to get a reduced amount. But that can be worked out later. Later, well, after you get it, you, you can bring evidence. That that person is paying toward uh, for a shelter, and that evidence might change the way that they look at the fair share. Okay. Okay. And then increase the amount. So that's it. Let's go to the next slide. I know it's complicated. <laughs> so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get a test at the end. I promise. <laughs> I'm not gonna test. Just have the 
to get more knowledge of what is being said today here. And when you have specific questions, we can we can have a consultation. And it's important that you understand some crucial um, information. So exercise, this is a summary that I put here together so you can grasp everything that we talk about in one time table. So exercise is connected with Medicaid. If you are an SSI recipient, you might be automatically eligible for Medicaid. And an SSI applicant is also an application for Medicaid. So once you complete the application for SSI, it is implicit that Medicaid is only with that as well. Okay. Uh, the program description is right there about what we just discussed economic needs based income and the cash payments are intended for to supplement. On which for potential. Okay. The next one is the eligibility criteria is that the person has to be disabled based on the criteria of the uh, security administration and someone that has limited resources and income. Okay. And the resources cannot exceed 2000. Uh, how to apply? I put the information right there. And this is the amounts that are the full amount or the amount. Most of the time, <laughs> The, two, the resources allowable, is that an annual limit or is that a monthly limit? Monthly, and I would say daily. 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 Because so security might do a um, financial review if, and they will ask you for access to their financial account, your bank account. If they say in any given day of the month that your bank went over, not yours, but your child, Adult child went over two thousand dollars. That will trigger stopping the, the eligibility criteria right there, and it's going to be penalized for twelve months without SSI cash payment and without Medicaid. How far back do they look when they evaluate that? They should be doing this evaluation once a year, but sometimes they might go back. Three years because they need a they review. And this is what happens. They go back three years and then they found out three years ago in January to have more than 2000. Well, you know what? We pay them three years that we shouldn't pay. Then you have an overpayment. Mm -hmm. If they haven't like caught up with themselves yet, can you fix that? Like, is there a that's like when you say, hey, this happened because that there, I don't know. Is there any There's some uh, loan sums on your account that, you, that is, they allow you nine months to use it, and it's not going to disqualify you. Okay. For example, <laughs> programmatic amount. Programmatic <laughs> amount means, okay, the person was eligible for SSDI, and then the loan sum went to the checking account, and that's the programmatic amount they will allow you nine months. But if it's about earnings or gifts, this is going to disqualify the person immediately. But if it doesn't, then it will later. There's no stopping that. Even, whenever they do the review, huh. whenever they do the review, and those overpayments are painful. Painful because three years of imagine. So let's say that you have one month where there's there's a burp, something happened that month, and you're you know one hundred dollars over the two thousand. Is it possible to appeal their decision? That's the law. That's the you cannot appeal and say let me explain. One dollar. No $1. exception. You're saying no exceptions. So this is one government agency that seems to actually be working. <laughs> Yeah, I had it. My son was on this and he was on it up until I turned 65 and I get my social security. But then they went back, and this is all during COVID, and I had opened an IRA account for my two boys, each one of them, years ago. And they found out that he had an IRA account that was over $2,000. We had to pay them back all the money. Thank you. Yep. So what I said. <laughs> it's something you have to, I mean, and they said, we, we see what you were trying to do. You're trying to help your 
kids or your son. That's why it's better to do a special needs trust yeah. for able yeah. accounts. And uh, we're going to have an attorney here in the second session. Yes. That's going to well, I learned that. Today. But if there's something you want to know about, and uh, you know, it's you're just, I was trying to say for a speech. That's why I'm providing this information so you don't talk. Yeah. Uh, so can you, so let's just say that happens and can you get back on SSI? What yes, after, after 12 months, okay, 12 months you, right. you can go back and present that you don't have those assets anymore and uh, always try to have a justified special needs trust account or able account yes. and then they're not going to ask any questions. <laughs> I have a question because I'm in the same situation. Um, now we are paying Social Security back. What happened when my child actually reached 18 and he applied to get would be a problem? That will be a, a good question and it's gonna take me away from the whole thing, but we can talk about that. Okay. Uh, so Here's that's you. the conclusion for SSI. I wanna okay. I I just two quick points. One that I got is 34. We had the same situation, some nominal amount of 2000 there in her bank account. First time it was like 12 months or 24 months that some pro rata reduction of her benefits. And it happened again, you know, three, four years ago. We just paid it because it was just a nuisance for her getting a reduced amount every month. And we said that, then they found out through one of these interviews, the, the food and shelter, you know, we're, she's living with us, we're paying it and all of a sudden it goes away. Uh, but but she still has Medicaid, but she has no SSI. But I'm sorry, I'm sure not here. But anyway, I'm really when we get to Social Security, I'm just anxious to do this. I'm not 65 yet, but I know there's a maximum family benefit, and she can get it. And then we don't have to deal with the other two thousand dollars. So I mean, that's my long term solution. I'll get there in a couple of years. So. Remember this um resource. Living resources is only applicable for SSI and then yeah. we have other problems. I'm trying to get other yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to get the questions at the time because that's the best time when you have yeah. it there and it's kind of on point. But also <laughs> have to feel a little bit. Okay. Um, Medicaid. Medicaid, we have two different types of Medicaid. Actually, then there's not two, it's many different types of but the, the most common ones are SSI, related Medicaid, and the other one is family related Medicaid. And that probably goes back to what you said your daughter doesn't have SSI but has Medicaid. Why? Because the, she's not receiving the SSI related Medicaid, but the one that children and family provide, right? Then you go to the money access. Account, uh, web portal and work like that. Family related to Medicaid. The eligibility criteria to be in is the same. Okay, but it's provided by different funding. Right? <clears throat> so that's the SSI related Medicaid. But the other one that is family related Medicaid, as I explained, is the same uh, eligibility criteria. One thing that I want to point out here that we never touch in probably never is that also some people have no Medicaid because they're not eligible uh, financially. They have assets or whatever they don't qualify, but they have a developmental disability and they need to use uh, the Medicaid waiver. Okay. If the person needs to use the Medicaid waiver, that this is through APD, Agency for Persons with Disabilities, then you have to go back to the My Access portal. And there's some boxes there that you need to check. And that, that one that says HCBS, that stands for Home and Community Based Services. That is the Medicaid waiver that if you sign your daughter needs it. You need to go back to the My Access portal and click on that specific one to get the Medicaid for that service. Okay. And the very criteria is the same. If you go over $2,000, you lose the Medicaid eligibility and so forth, you lose the home and community based services 
on this way, way, way. Any questions on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so if you have the bed waiver, you still held to that two thousand dollar. Yes. Um what if you're a provider under that waiver? Uh, so my kids have the waiver and I am a provider. CDC plus. CDC plus. It, it doesn't matter. It's just, you said that's then. So that would go to um, Scott, right? Start trust. Well, the thing is that if you are on Medicaid waiver, yeah. regardless of using the regular um, payment method with the agency or through the CDC, client direct care, you have to be eligible for Medicaid. And the eligibility entails the two thousand dollars, and that's important because many people. But I don't know why because I have this, but I I lose my eligibility, and now I don't have the services, and that's the problem. As soon as they see one day in your statement that you went over two thousand dollars, the benefit will be suspended for twelve months. Okay. Oh, the waiver services will be suspended for 12 months. Huh. Yes, thank you. That's big because it's a big thing. <laughs> okay. So how to apply? Well, then SSI today and then pay comes with the application that we do for the SSI. And the family integrated Medicaid has to be done separately as then my access portal will access for it and do the one for children of families. Okay. So if, can you repeat what you just said about applying? You can have the SSI, but to once you have Medicaid, you can apply for the Medicaid waiver? Yes. Okay. Well the Medicaid waiver for the developmental disability population is uh it's an application that is done separately and the eligibility for to be in that waiver, uh, medically speaking, is having the diagnosis of developmental disability, any of those. And number two, it has to be, the diagnosis has to be done before the person turns eight. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So once that eligibility is done through APD, Agency for Persons with Disabilities, then you're in the wait list, at the time that person is ready to go into services, you have to go back to the Medicaid website and click on the home and community based services. So the Medicaid funding for that program will be released to the APD and the Medicaid. Waiver. So if someone has a someone who's 25 years old has a catastrophic accident, they were not disabled or considered having a disability prior to that, but now they have because they have brain injury or whatever. They will never be eligible for the waiver because they're over 18. For that Medicaid waiver, no, because that is called DD, developmental disability. Okay. And that means the person was born with that condition. So anything that was acquired later on might be other waivers. For example, several policy is not it doesn't mean developmental disability, but uh, uh, traumatic brain injury because of an accident. Mm -hmm. DBI has their own waiver. It's not a developmental disability waiver, it's the uh, DBI. And what's so, the waiting list to get the waiver? Uh, I don't think so. No waiting list? I don't list? think so. I don't think that uh, the traumatic brain injury waiver has a wait list. What about just plain old Medicaid? 15 years. It, it all depends. 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So, you unless, go, so start unless young. you come in under crisis. And then there's a, there's a seven priorities when it comes to who gets on the waiver, the, the general waiver. So you're saying and start immediate. Oh, yeah. Anyone that has a diagnosis of developmental disability before the age of 18, I will submit the application for the Medicaid waiver immediately. At that moment, you might, the person might not be eligible for services in immediately. By facing the witness. The good thing about being in the witness is if at some point during that time that you're waiting, any emergency situation happens 
or the parents that are the only providers have a surgery, cannot be uh, providing the 24 7 care for that child, then the med waiter is going to come in with the med funding and provide that support. Uh, I had a case several years ago. Uh, the child was in the med waiver, in the wait list, and he never had any kind of med, uh, mental health problems. But after the age of 18, he made an onset on mental health and he got a crisis and he got very paranoid. The family was totally different, they didn't know what to do. And they had to call the police because it was violence and, and all that. And say, no, no, no. It's on the wait list, call APD immediately. They will set an attorney to advocate for him and get all those charges out. <coughs> And also, you don't have to pay for that attorney. APD will support that. And when the wait list, the crisis happened, APD will come in and come in. So that's why it's so important to have, to be at least in the wait list. Yes. Um, our son, uh, all of our children are adopted from the state of Florida. So when um, we got him, we automatically get Medicaid, even though he is on our insurance. He has a Medicaid supplement. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, he turns 15 this year, so we're trying to be proactive. He is, uh, he has a Lennox Gastone, so a rare form of epilepsy, so he also um, has brain damage, has had four brain surgeries. Um, he's currently on Medicaid, so we are trying to, I'm, I'm already talking to Human Services Program Specialist Agency for Persons with Disabilities, Pamia. Um, so we do need to start now applying for that med waiver because it is something different from this Medicaid, correct? So once he turns 18, because he's 15 this year, once he turns 18, he'll be able to stay on my husband's funds for a little while, but there's going to be that crossover. Yeah, the so Medicaid sure. waiver is a fund longer than Medicaid, okay? And it is available to assist individuals with developmental disabilities to stay living independently in the community with support, oh. not in the institutions that they used to be years ago. So the whole goal is that this, that fund went to the Medicaid. Medicaid is managing those funds. The program is available for those that need the support to continue living in the community in an integrated manner. And that is different from the SSI. So, because we, I was told, I tried to apply to put uh, money into the special needs trust for him um, through SSI, but we were told that we make too much money for him to be eligible for SSI. When the son turns 18, your income doesn't, it's not going to be taken into consideration. So then he just, He's the only one. He cannot make over two thousand dollars. Not, not our household. And then, then we can apply for the med waiver at eighteen. But I want to start the process now because I, I mm -hmm. understand. You can apply, apply for the med waiver right now. Yes, you yes. can apply as soon as you get the diagnosis. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for it. Sorry. You can apply. But <clears throat> for the services, SSI. That for SSI. They will be looking at the parents' income before the age of 18. Okay, so don't worry about that until he turns 18. But wow, you can tell how much better. A tip that I give you right now if your child is under the age of 18, the parents have accepted income, it doesn't matter that you apply. Mm -hmm. I would say it's better, the best practice is to apply, even though you're going to get, he's going to get denied. Mm -hmm. What you already did? Oh, right. We applied and we got denied. Yeah, perfect. He's already in the system, and that's a great thing. Being in the system means at, at, the, at the point that he turns 18, the same the next day you want to go to Social Security, he's already in the system. Less problem for you, so they already have records. Another thing is, if one of the parents becomes disabled in the meantime or pass away. That opens the parents' work record to provide the benefits to the child. And then the limited resources is not going to be taken into consideration because they're going to be looking at a different kind of entitlement, which is that tool for federal Medicare and SSDI, disabled 
child disabled benefits, which is different from that. Okay. Somebody else? The developmentally disabled adult child already receiving uh, Medicaid in move states, uh, state into the state of Florida. Are there any filing requirements within the yes. servitor or guardian? The requirements uh, for Medicaid come down from the federal government <laughs> that each state has some kind of a mediation. It could be a little more, a little less, more restrictive, less restrictive. So my goal is to explain to you what you need to do is terminate a Medicaid in the previous state before you can open in the new state. Because if you have both at the same time, that's a penalization. They don't allow you to apply in the new state until you close the Medicaid with the other, the other state. If already in the system, however, is there any sort of a lag in between, a coverage lag? It is. While you wait, it is and do you need a new controlling legal authority, like a new guardianship, you're coming with a conservatorship? Yeah, but the Medicaid functions independently, state by state. They don't have a, it's not like SSDI that is federal. So it's all connected, it doesn't matter where you are. SSI mm -hmm. and Medicaid is handled and managed by the state. So you need to close that Medicaid in the other state in order to open a new Medicaid. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, talking about SSDI or secure, uh, Social Security Disability Insurance, when we see disability insurance, we're talking about, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about um, the work credits. If the person doesn't have the work credits or have worked and pay for the disability insurance through work, then you cannot get SSDI. If a young adult has never worked, that person is not going to be eligible for SSDI because that got the law. That's the title of the law. I mean, uh, <laughs> how do you measure the credits? Every year, the government has established an amount that is equivalent to one credit, and the maximum amount that we can have uh, credits per year is four. So this year, one credit equals 1640. If you if you earn this amount of money, then you completed the four credits for this year. That's how it works about the credits. Someone that wants to get a disability, depending on the age, has to have a certain amount of credits. I cannot go through much detail, but you have that information there. Uh, for example, anybody before the age of 24 will need only six credits. And that's one of the reasons that we tell the, the parents to allow the young adults that are able to work at some, some level to get those six credits before they turn 24. Because then that opens their own work record to get SSDI, which is more flexible, and then you get Medicaid as well. What happened is the young adults that work too much and they transition from SSI to SSDI. What happens is sometimes they get SSDI, but the amount is so little, like three hundred dollars, and then SSI will say, "Okay, maximum amount is nine hundred, right? Nine hundred fourteen, whatever." But then he's working on making, uh, he's getting SSDI, three hundred dollars, nine hundred minus three hundred, six hundred. He they will be getting SSDI a little bit plus SSI, Medicare and. <clears throat> I have very limited time, yeah. and I need to, <laughs> to see if I can finish my slides. Uh, how the years and how much the credits play? If you have any records here, if you want to go back and see if it's on the work, at what level was that year, so you can count how the credits. Uh, or else, yeah, there's not much here, it's just that. The person has to be disabled based on the social security definition of disability, number one and number two. The person will have to have uh, the work credits. Those two things. Uh, some people go to work and they are afraid of losing their benefits, but there are a lot of work incentives. 
and the work incentives are information uh, uh, expenses the person can have that will be overriding the amount that they count. Okay. So they call it impairing related work expenses. One of the most common work expenses are transportation expenses. So if the person can no work, cannot drive. So transportation is considered special. Uh, some people also don't have any pay, but they have uh, Medicare. So Medicare has a uh, co-payment, some deductibles. So you have to pay something for some medication, office visits, co-payments. That is deductible as well. But you have a list there of all the things that are considered ill. Um, for example, Government medical services, payment, transportation, attendant care, your coaching, residential modification, and mm -hmm. all that is included as an impairment to daily work expenses. For this year, let's talk about student earning from exclusion. The student earning from exclusion is a specific work incentive for students. Uh, if the students are under the age of 22, they can work, and that goes hand by hand to what I said, let them work before they turn 24, so they end the credits. So if they work, they can, Social Security was going to exclude up to 8,950 per year. Those are for the students that are receiving SSI students that are in school, high school, and they want to work some, that's great because if they are working and they are attending school, this amount is going to be available. So as security is not going to count this amount uh, as earnings. So the, the student can work, get all his SSI, also get his income, and then he's earning the work credits for SSI. So this is the perfect age for the young adults to go to work. And again, the credits. Um, this is more details about how, what is the criteria for them to be eligible for to qualify for this work incentive. You have it in your record there in the notes, but mainly the student has to be attending a school that is credited, and they have to have so, so many hours a week in school so they can qualify for that work incentive. Okay. Next question. <laughs> I gotta rush a little bit more because I know that I have many hours. We have two minutes, two minutes for questions. Oh, anyway. You have till about ten after Adela. Huh? You have till about ten after Adela. Okay. 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 Yes. okay perfect. Ah. So, what if the disability benefits put them over? That's tricky. Disability benefits, you're talking about SSDI? SSI. No, SSDI doesn't care about limits. SSI does, but does SSI care about SSDI if it puts that over 2000? SSI is the only one that will be looking into the excessive assets. SSDI only cares about being disabled and having the work credits. So if it was excessive because of SSDI? Well, so SSDI, if I understand, um, if you get SSDI and it's more than the $900 max that SSI would give you, you just don't get SSDI. Exactly. It's just, it's just that will become zero. That's what happened with my brother. His, he gets SSDI as a survivor benefit for my mother, um, but it it's like $50 shy of 90 bucks. So SSI was just going to give you 50 They can <laughs> make up that difference. And then at that point, all you want to lose from that is the Medicaid. <clears throat> and then you can go to family related Medicaid and apply on Medicaid. SSI is the, the other program amount is over than SSI, then SSI becomes zero. Okay. Yes. I'm, uh, so I, I think I got confused a little bit with the SSDI. <laughs> if the person was born disabled, then they cannot get those work credits. All right. So they can never get SSDI? I wouldn't say never, because some people with disabilities mm -hmm. can work and can get their work credits and can get disability. 
and I have an example right here. Um, <laughs> no, no, but I, what I'm saying is it looked like in your definition that it was they needed some credits before they had the disability. Was that in the definition of it where they can acquire it when they have their disability? The the work. Well, they said before they get the disability because Social Security is referring to people that acquired the disability. Right. But when someone is born with a disability, yes. that will count again. Also. They so can, you can just, can, so if yeah, you yeah. have to work, if they can work with their disability, Absolutely. they can acquire these work Absolutely. credits. Many okay. young adults that only yeah. qualify for SSI okay, go to work and little by little through the years, yes. they get the credits and then they have SSDI and SSI right. until the amount of SSDI becomes higher or greater than SSI. And then that wipes out SSI S amount. SSI in it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then you would get kicked out of Medicaid. Exactly. Okay. And if you lose the Medicaid because of the SSI terminated for that reason, mm -hmm. then you have the option to use the family related Medicaid. There's a protection for that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my question. I mean, my son receives the child disabled benefit from his stepmom. So he receives SSDI. He does not receive SSI. And he also receives the Medicaid waiver. But I mean, his, my issue is income to my son, like support from my ex husband. But if, if he doesn't qualify for Medicaid because of an income issue, can he still qualify for the waiver? I thought he would also not qualify for the waiver. The, the assets will, will definitely mm -hmm. affect the eligibility for Medicaid, number one. And the Medicaid so waiver about the two thousand dollar a month asset, two thousand dollars. Yeah, and that will affect the Medicaid eligibility right there. Mm -hmm. And the Med waiver is a form of Medicaid. But if you spend that down every month, there's never more than two thousand dollars. There's no one return. You think there's more than two thousand? It's about keeping assets sitting there. Right. Maybe someone earns three thousand dollars a month, and there's uh, about twenty six thousand. A year that the person can earn and not lose the Medicaid. Right. Yeah. Medicaid waiver that is not income need based, no. financial based. Right. Well, that's financial right. based. And they also have an income threshold. Yeah. For Medicaid about, waiver. Yeah. I think it's about it. Yes, sir. Uh, for those of us that are uh, approaching retirement and uh, eligible to take advantage of Social Security benefits, could you offer your perspectives on the, this maximum family benefit? Because what we've been told is when I retire and start receiving Social Security, my daughter can participate in that through this maximum family benefit. But then, and then she comes out of this SSI model and the two thousand yes. dollars. I assume it, I assume she wouldn't come out of medic the Medicaid program that she's part of, but maybe she does. But any any perspectives on well, the maximum family benefit and whether that's well what I see is when someone is eligible for Medicaid um uh, Medicaid waiver because of their disability, yeah. most of the time they are eligible for that service, even though the range of earnings or assets is bigger. But that's something that has to be discussed individually with the APD agency with person with disabilities, they will have the last word. Any, any any thoughts on this maximum family benefit? Do most do most people take advantage of that for the disabled the adult the the child? Uh... I I don't I don't have the answers. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have one online. Oh, okay. Uh, Amy Foster is asking, what is the fee for a benefits consultation with IAS? I will charge one hundred and fifty per hour. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that completes my presentation today. If you have any questions that you want to consultate, you have my information, and I will have any that Thank you. Thank you. That was the only one of these for targeting. See, and this is the second time that we've had where a social center for women to reach out and have additional questions. Um, next, we're going to uh, discuss guardianship. And uh, our presenter is Sadani. 
Uh, Lisa became a partner at Walmart and Guarantee and Associates PA in 2018. She assists clients in designing comprehensive plans tailored to meet their goals and objectives, giving them peace of mind and knowing that they have planned for their future and provided for their families for successive generations. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you um, for everyone for being here. Thank you for our ability for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today on guardianships. So, um, okay, so um, this is going to be kind of a crash course on guardianships, uh, guardianships 101. Um, I will welcome any questions if you may have any questions along the way or if you have a question answer at the end, or if you want to do it. Um, but today we're going to kind of talk a little bit, um, it's kind of like a roadmap. We're going to talk about what is a guardianship? Um, do I need a guardianship? What rights uh, may be made by a guardian? And um, what are the types of guardianship? What's a guardian advocacy? And, um, and then what's the process? How does the guardianship process work? Uh, what are the requirements and what are the guardian's duties once um, someone is a guardian? So let's start at the very beginning. What is a guardianship? Well, a guardianship is through the court and it is a legal process. So if someone is not able to handle or make sound decisions of their health care, financial, uh, a person may be appointed um, by the court to make those decisions for them. And, and it's usually considered like a person property. So the person taking care of the person and then the property being a guardian of the property being the person that takes care of the financial aspects. <laughs> so um, again, the guardian would have the legal authority to then act in, those, in that regard. So I'm gonna use a little example. We're gonna call Mary and Larry. We're gonna talk about Mary and Larry throughout this entire presentation. But Mary and Larry have two children, Barry and Carrie. And Carrie has Down syndrome, and she is going to be turning 18 in a couple months. But when Carrie turns 18, she's considered an adult. And Mary and Larry will not be able to continue to make important decisions for her since she's already a legal adult, or will be a legal adult. So Mary and Larry are concerned about healthcare decisions, right? Um, financial decisions. And also, what if she gets influenced by somebody or manipulated by someone. Uh, so they've heard about guardianships. They've also heard about his attorney and a fake claim documents. Um, but what should they do for caring? So um, legisl legislatively, there's the intent, the least restrictive alternative. I'm sure many of you probably heard the least restrictive alternative in the IEP world, right? In school education, right? What is the least restrictive alternative? So on the one side, we have estate planning. And um, a big, big issue with estate planning is it's revocable, meaning it can be changed. So yes, you can set up a power of attorney um, to name someone to make financial decisions, uh, a designation of healthcare surrogate to give someone the authority to make Healthcare decisions. But keep in mind, they're revocable. So, again, if one of the concerns that Mary and Larry have is that someone might influence, unduly influence Carrie, this may not be the right approach, right? On the other side, we have guardianship. And guardianship is, again, court supervision, legal authority to um, have someone appointed to make those types of decisions. Again, person, property, health, and the Can I ask you a question already? Are there irrevocable trusts that put the person as a power of attorney? No. I would not do an irrevocable trust. It's a little different. Because again, the bottom line with the state planning is you have to have the capacity to um, make these documents. So again, when we're talking healthcare documents or power of attorney documents, um, that would mean like in my example, carry making those documents. So again, if you don't have the ability or the capacity to do those documents, then that may not be the right approach. So um, so that would, um, now on the other side, there's also estate planning and I'm kind of digressing um, for Mary and Larry in my scenario that they may want to do for planning for the future. 
um, you know, the special needs trust, things like that. Um, but for our scenario, um, you know, again, you know, that's we're talking about um, the mental capacity to do those types of documents and the concerns of it being revocable and changeable and easily manipulated. All right, so so then we kind of go to what okay, now that we um are trying to figure out what should we go with? Estate planning, guardianship, there are certain rights that a guardian would have and um, certain rights that the person would take away from that person or rights to be removed and other rights that a, a guardian could, um, or powers or abilities that a guardian could um, delegate. So um, you look at kind of like the first set uh, of the rights that can be removed and um, to marry, to vote, to personally apply for government benefits, to have a driver's license, uh, to travel, to seek uh, employment, and then the delegation to a guardian, um, the right to contract, the right to um, defend lawsuits or sue, the right to make financial decision-making, healthcare decisions, and um, determining the residence. Um, ward, I, I say this throughout, that, that ward is the, is the person that is under a guardianship. So let's look at the different types of guardianship. A plenary guardianship is a full guardianship. And so just like before, when I had all this slide on all the powers, rights, and um, the delegation of certain rights, a full guardianship would mean that we need to take away all that and allow the, other, and allow the guardian to do certain things. That would be a full guardianship or a plenary guardianship. A limited guardianship is where some rights may be retained, but other rights may need to be um, passed on to a, a guardian. That would be a limited guardianship. So it's really kind of going through that criteria and then making that determination on whether the individual can maintain certain rights. A minor guardianship is just kind of a side note, but a minor guardianship just means that someone is under the age of 18 and they received an inheritance hypothetically, and now they are receiving money, but they are a minor, they cannot maintain that, so they have to set a guardianship up for that. Again, goes back to estate planning and properly planning ahead, so we don't have those types of situations. We would set up trust in those situations. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the guardian advocacy. Uh, the guardian advocacy is a special type of guardianship that um, is designed for individuals with developmental disabilities. So what that means is, Again, going through the same process with the court and establishing a guardianship, but it's a special type, a special type of guardianship. So the guardian advocate would be appointed by the court, by the court and for a person with a developmental disability. And um, that um, the court appoints that person without making a determination of that adjudication, basically to make without making an adjudication of incapacity. So what does that mean exactly? The definition of um, developmentally disabled uh, is a person with a developmental disability that is attributable to intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, autism, spina bifida, Down syndrome, felon McDermott syndrome, or prayer willy syndrome that manifests before the age of 18, and that constitutes a substantial handicap that can be reasonably expected to continue indefinitely. So um, under Florida statute, that is the definition of a development, developmentally disabled individual that would fall under a guardian advocacy guardianship. So let's take another look. What does it mean when it says without adjudication of incapacity? So again, in guardian advocacy, we do not need to declare a person with a developmental disability incapacitated. What we do then is provide a doctor's note, essentially. And the doctor's note would say that the person has a developmental disability or diagnosis of autism, Down syndrome, whatever the case may be, and that is used to file with the court in making that um, guardianship uh, determination. 
that's different than a full guardianship or a limited guardianship. That one, we do have to make a determination by the court that the individual is considered incapacitated. How that's done is the court appoints an examining committee. It's a three-member team, if you will, um, that consists of a doctor, sometimes nurse, social worker, um, but the court appoints this examining committee to make that determination. So they um, do an evaluation of the individual and their capacity, and then that is presented to the court in determining whether that individual does indeed um, lack the capacity and his needs for guardianship. Yes. For the guardian advocacy, is that something, is that a situation where, like, let's say the person, the ward um, meets someone, gets influenced, would they have to go through the court to try and appeal to take the guardian advocacy away from a specific person? Like, if it's to a parent, but then they meet someone and they're like, I don't think the parent should be the guardian advocacy, I should be the guardian. Like, is it is it something that the court would have to allow transfer? That would be all through the court. Okay. Because it is all supervised by the court. Right. And so therefore, if there was any dispute or anything like that, it would have to be handled. So both of these are like at 18, right? Like we're talking at 18, the advocacy and the guardian school guardianship. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Because as a minor, um, you know, you're under the parent, right? So um yes. How how recent does the uh physician's report need to be? Oh, it needs to be usually within 90 days. Um, so it, it, when we file it, we want a current um, report. And it's actually a, a specific type of document that we file. It's called a physician's report. And it's a specific state um, you know, required form that we provide to the client and then they take it to their doctor to fill out. Thank you. Yes. I, I just wanted to add just like an anecdote that I had to go through this process, but my sister had her guardians as my parents who are now too old to do it. So even when you do this the first time, you may have to do it again. Right. So I had to go through the whole entire yes. process to become the guardian. Right. So that is a question that, that raises like our plan, uh, because we adopted our son when we were older, that once we age out, that he will go to our daughters yeah. So yeah. should we, uh, we were talking about applying for the full guardianship. Should we not apply for that? Should we apply for the guardian advocacy or? They're just two different approaches. And so it's, it all depends, again, going back to where I have the list. And we need, um, you know, if we have to mark out every single one of those uh, criteria, then typically it's a full guardianship. If there's certain rights that we can maintain, then guardian advocates and you fall under the definition of adult. Can that be tra transferred or changed? It's our daughter. It's so they just would have to apply once we get too old. They they would just have to apply. Start over when yeah. So if you're no longer able or do not want to continue to serve, and I've had situations where we had two parents and it was just common co, co guardians and one had passed away. So we had to then continue the guardianship and one could still be the guardian, but we still had to show that the person had passed away. If another one that does need to be appointed, then that is a whole process to appoint someone else as a guardian. But if, if their daughter is already over the age of 18, can't you visit it as a successor guardian and the original guardianship? Because for my son, mm -hmm. we have like three or four people that I'm currently the guardian. Like we have the successor. So yes. I assume yes. in the original yes. document, you could name your successor yes. guardian, assuming she's currently. Yeah, old. absolutely. So I always say over and over, estate planning documents, your wills, um, trust, things like that. I you've got to put that in. If there's something happened to both of you or whoever as guardians, who do you want to make sure steps in and be the guardian after that? So again, you know, putting the successor guardianships um, in, especially in your state planning documents. And I will be saying that later. I'll <laughs> repeat myself. But anyway, who can be a guardian advocate? Yes. Is there another question? What are the how are the rights different between a guardian and guardian advocate? The rights are the same. The rights right. are the same. It's just it's just what direction are you going in? <clears throat> what what would the use of the determination decide which direction? Well, and, and that's where on the previous slide where I was saying like the right to marry, the right to vote, the right to uh, driver's license. 
So a guardian advocacy is that you can keep some of those rights. The individual. Mm -hmm. If the individual, if you feel the individual can keep some of those rights. A full guardianship is saying that you know all those rights need to be taken away, basically. So I'm what is the difference it. between a guardian advocacy and limited yeah. guardianship? That's I don't know. Well, guardian advocacy is specific for developmental disabilities. Yeah. And so the limited guardianship can be, it's a very similar approach, but you would have to, and especially if you don't fall under the definition of a developmental disability, mm -hmm. then you would go into a limited guardianship. Yes. A quick two part. Is there a different standard or burden of, of proof for a plenary guardianship versus a limited guardianship? Two, I guess, does the court have a bias towards which one you go to? And three, I know didn't see anything about social contacts as one of the powers of the guardianship. So, no, there's no difference between a limited and a plenary um, as far as, you know, the criteria. Um, and, and as far as uh, I've done quite a few guardianships, plenary, and I've done quite a few guardian advocacies, and you know, follow your lead. There's, it just depends on again, every client situation is different, and so that's the direction you go in. Um, so, uh, and then the last question about social, 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 social contact, like social, like I, I mean, not right. your question. Yeah, who she, uh, who a conserved or a guardian, a ward. Uh, Required visitation or not visitation, travel, who, uh, well, then, who they associate with. Is that part of the court procedure or not? Right, that would be a guardian because then again, one of the powers yeah. is to travel or to whatever. So again, that guardian is now in charge of the ward and making those type of decisions on who they can interact with and who, where do they travel and things like that. And the guardian is in charge of that. All right, so again, who can be a guardian advocate? Um, so Basically, any Florida resident that's over the age of 18. So, um, again, going back to where we name successors, a lot of times we see that if the parents aren't able and they have other children. In my example, Barry, he's the older son, right? And so, if something happened to Mary and Larry, we have Barry who can be a successor. Um, a non resident of Florida can also serve as a guardian, but they have to be related to the individual. And then, of course, it's kind of a no brainer if you committed a felony, sure, the one to be qualified to serve as a guardian. Um, Excuse so, me. So, yes. Just on that point, then. Yes. Um, we have a limited guardianship for my daughter who it's in another state. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now residents of Florida, but mm -hmm. my, my our daughter is still at the other state. So, and, and this advocacy. Uh, Guardianship was a Florida statute. Yes. Not all, maybe some other states didn't have that in structure, but could we be thinking about whether we should change the limited guardianship in the other state, even though my daughter was a resident there? We're here. Is any views on that in terms of? Models? Yeah, no, it depends. It all matters on the residency of the individual. So of the individual. If, yes. So if the ward is a resident of the state of Florida, we follow Florida. If they, if the family moves, hypothetically, um, from one state to another, then we need to domesticate that. And that, and the individual lives here, and the individual lives here in the state of Florida. The ward lives here in the state of Florida, then we need to domesticate that here in Florida. A guardian advocacy can be, it's very state-specific. A lot of other states do not have a guardian advocacy. Yeah. Um, I can only kind of attest to Pennsylvania and Indiana because I practice there, um, but both of those states do not offer the same um, guardian advocacy that Florida does. So it is an option for individuals that are coming from out of state and they move here to Florida, they will need to domesticate their guardianship, but most importantly, they will have that option if they want to use a guardian advocacy if that is appropriate for that situation. But under, under the limited guardianship, I can still not keep that in place. It's in another state, but right. I, just because I am a resident of Florida now, that, that doesn't in any way impact that structure. Again, that would be under the state law of that state, oh. um, but, um, you know, I, again, Lake East in Florida, a non-resident can serve oh. as a guardian, so again, it would be that state law oh. on that issue. Thank you. So I kind of like kind of mapped out the process of um, setting up a guardianship, and this is kind of the same regardless of the type of guardianship that we would use, but the first one is obviously to determine the type of guardianship. And so we kind of talked about guardian advocacy. Do we do a plenary guardianship? Do we just do a limited guardianship? So once we figure out what direction we're going, 
Then we file the documents with the court and we petition the court to name someone to be a guardian. So as I said earlier, um, parents can serve as a co-guardian. We can have a co-guardian situation. And so then um, the court uh, appoints an attorney to represent the individual. So that is across the board. It does not matter what type of guardianship. And the reason behind that is because, again, keep in mind, you're taking away rights of an individual. And that's why there is a court-appointed attorney to represent that individual. Okay. Um, then there is a court hearing uh, to appoint the guardian. I will add in there in the little middle because um, just to kind of show the comparison of the two, if we're going in a plenary guardianship, when the court appoints an attorney to represent the individual, they're also appointing the examining committee members and they will do the evaluation at that phase um, with on a guardian advocacy because we submitted the doctor's note, the physician's report when we filed the documents, that part is not part of a guardian advocacy approach. The hearing, once the, uh, at the hearing, then, um, you know, a, a guardianship is established and our guardian is appointed as um, to act on behalf of the individual. There's going to be a lot of requirements that when you serve as a guardian. One, you're going to have to get a credit, credit check. You're going to have to get a background check. And you're also going to have educational requirements. I'll dive a little deeper in my next slide. This is kind of just a summary. And then there's the initial plan, which you need to file with the court. And then finally, every single year, you're going to be filing an annual plan. Yes. Annual accounting. Um, so I was having a lot, quite a bit of trouble with it. You know somebody that does it, like an accountant around here? I think I sent a message to your firm, but I didn't hear it. Um, Because I, I can't see. And now so I'm trying to dispense it through, um, because he does, my son is officer out he lives in the facility. I'm trying to dispense it uh, through a, uh, a lawyer. But the problem is that, so we're the guardians, but we're not the payee, the representative payee. Mm -hmm. So is that going to prohibit us from being able to dispense that, you know, file a motion to dispense? Um, well, first off, they, going back to your accounting requirement, yeah, that's something that is required typically because um, you have to get an attorney involved when you're going through this process. We do the ongoing accountings and um, things every year. So usually it's your, your attorney that you're working yes, with. Yes, my attorney doesn't do it. She said, tell your account, my account. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I, I know, I know every, every attorney is different, yeah. but that's just part of what we do. do so do you end. know, like, if, if you're the representative, if you're not the representative payee, because the money goes to the, the home he lives in, hmm. and then can you... Still file a motion to dispense, or he um, doesn't I, have any money, really. So, so the representative payee is not the same as the guardian. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I have not run into a situation like that before. Usually, it is the same person. Okay. Um, so I would know that, and I would ask your daughter, but she was. I I'm a payee, so I. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm what, what, I didn't know what you said. She's saying situation. I'm, my daughter's rep <laughs> maybe, so I cannot be her guardian. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, allowed to be. <laughs> all right. All right. So um, going back to now we've established a guardianship and you're appointed guardian. So, and again, it doesn't matter what type of guardianship you have, it's the same powers, the same responsibilities, the same duties. So, whether it's guardian advocacy or not, um, you'll, you're still. Appointed guardian, you'll get what's called letters of guardianship, and that'll give you the authority to you know, go to the doctors or whatever the case may be on behalf of um, the individual. All guardians in Florida must, must, must submit to a criminal background check. Um, they are also, um, you have to submit a credit history report, and you have to complete an eight hour educational requirement. It is online, and, um, and but that is a requirement. Now, there are times that the court has, in its discretion, waived some of those requirements. I will say, as across the board, I've done guardian advocacies where the parents were um, the guardian advocate, and one, we still had to do a criminal check, and one, we did not have to. So again, never enough. 
Is that, do they keep doing that annually or? No, it's when, when you're time? at the very beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that for successor guardians as well? Yes, yes. Because um, again, it's the same process. When someone else is changing, you know, changing the change of the guard, they gotta go through the same process. All right. So um, now again, you're appointed guardian. So what is your first step? That is the initial report. And that is filed within 60 days of being appointed a guardian. Um, first is the initial plan. The initial plan is kind of like of the person. So what, um, where's the individual going to be living? Where's the, you know, what type of, um, you know, doctors or therapists or things like that? What is their needs or social needs? And that's the initial plan. The initial inventory is, again, what are the assets? Uh, what are the incomes? You make a list of that. A lot of times there's only social security. So um, the individual, especially an 18 year old, may not have assets, um, but, only, um, but only social security. Again, that just gets reported on that inventory. The same would be for the annual report. Same thing every year, um, the annual plan. What is happening the plan for, the, for that year, upcoming year? And, um, and then the annual accounting, is to list out all the financial assets and income of the ward. Again, when I said before, sometimes the individual may only have social security. So we can, um, oftentimes, we go ahead and request the waiver um, of that requirement. So we petition the court and ask the court to waive the annual accounting requirement since the individual is only on social security. Yes. Would that apply if they're on an SSI and SSDI? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So any type of social security benefits. Okay. So um, let's go back to my scenario. We got Mary and Larry. What should they do? Well, in this particular case, and then under the circumstances of the scenario, um, a guardian advocacy could be a option. Um, it could be considered, again, the least restrictive option. Because a guardian advocacy, we don't have to declare someone incapacitated. And by simply using a doctor's note, Carrie in our scenario falls under the de definition of a developmental disability, Down syndrome being that. And then once Carrie turns 18, we got a guardianship in place. Now Larry and Mary can continue to make health care decisions for her or financial decisions. So that would be step one. Step two. Is the same thing for Larry and Mary because again, as we pointed out earlier, what happens if something happened to our guardians? And so again, planning for what happens if something, um, if they were to pass away, or or if they had a long-term illness and are not able to continue in that regard. So again, the wills, the trusts, the power of attorneys, the healthcare surrogate living will, all the basic estate planning documents, and the decisions that we need to make. Mary and Carrie will need to consider is who's the successor guardian, as we pointed out. And again, I always like to name backups. So, um, you know, if so, if you know, Barry can serve, or is there another family member that can serve, but in the wills to put the succession of who they would like to take care of Carrie. And then finally, special needs trust. So, again, um, we don't want um, without planning because, again, we just talked about government benefits, right? And so if that, if carries on SSI or Medicaid or some type of government benefit and Mary and Larry passed away, we want to make sure that the inheritance that they receive or Carrie receives in this is held in a special needs trust. So, um, so again, special needs trust and the revocable trust documents, um, very, very important. So step one, step two, both of them are important. Oh, um, a special needs trust is basically like a protected savings account is what um, you said. Is that the, yeah. So as a special needs trust, um, there's many different types, and I could always be happy to talk about that another time, but special needs trust that, um, so basically if the, um, it supplements, it supplements the social security that the individual is on. So it will not jeopardize those benefits because of the way it's grown up. It's a special type of trust that is there for their entire lifetime. They cannot, you know, the individual cannot be the trustee. So you name someone else, again, maybe the brother or whatever family member um, that would be named as the trustee of that trust. That trust doesn't come into being 
until the parents have passed away. That form is a third party special needs trust. There's always a standalone. You always set that one up as well. So, hence, yes. Roughly right um, for ballpark. What's the cost yeah. between the plenary and the efficacy? Um, um, I, I will say that the, the plenary guardianship costs more because there's more involved because you have the examining committee. So everybody's got to have a fee, right? So the court appointed attorney has a fee, the examining committee charges a fee. It's a little more involved in that type of guardianship. 50% more than in advocacy or? Yes, because uh, again, the advocacy doesn't require the sure. examining committee. So yes, it, it would be a, a less cost um, approach. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. How long does it take to do this? This is a long process, isn't it? Um, not necessarily, no. I mean, like oh, no. once you get the hearing, and um, you know, usually filing the documents, I would say about a month, but month and it's really, yeah, well, it depends on how quickly you want to get a hearing. And, and it always so depends there's... on the lawyer that you choose <laughs> as well. Like if you get a company that knows what they're talking about, yeah. That's fun. <laughs> is any a, other question? Yeah, is a guardian advocacy completely customizable? Like, or are there certain standards within the guardianship? Um, uh, you know, requirements that have to be part of that. Have to just, um, you know, because you, you went through that whole list of mm -hmm. voting, working, etc. So, right. does that mean that you can kind of like a, a choose which one you want kind of thing? Or yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It's very tailored to the situation. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's you know, driver's license or something like that, or voting or whatever. You know, every every person's different, right? right. And so every guardian advocacy or even every guardianship can be very different because of that individual and what they're able to do. So yeah, it's very customized. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you have a full guardianship in, in a state with a ward and the ward and the guardian move to another state, you have to go through this. You yeah. can't take it with you or it doesn't yeah, it's every state. Yeah. 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 Start all that's, it. that's what I'm saying. Domesticated the word. Yes, we will have to go through the process. Yeah. Is there any reason why we should do this now? So, like right now, in my mind, like if our son went to Golisano's, we're not technically his guardian because we don't have it designated and they won't talk to us about his medical care in that situation. Is it in our best interest to become guardians now? How old is the child? He's going to be 13. So I'm just going to tell you uh, who wants me to stand up. Yeah. So uh, our Jake is 35 years old. And uh, we became plenary guardians when he turned 18. And our, uh, our legal team said, about six months before he turns 18, get the paperwork ready, yada, yada, yada. 18 years in one day, mm -hmm. we'll get to court. So uh, about two years later, he's 20. And we were on the other coast visiting family, and he stepped up a crook. He twisted his ankle and was limping to the car. So we went back and forth with do the 120 miles and get to Naples community or figure out now if something broke. We decided to figure it now since something. So <clears throat> put him in a wheelchair, wheeled him into the emergency room in the hospital in Boca, showed all the ID, waited for the x-ray, orderly came to transport him to x-ray. He put his hands in the door, Jim, his body don't think so. <laughs> so the orderly pulled the chair back and gave him back to us and said, he's 20 years old. He's refusing the matter. We didn't have guardianship papers in our glove compartment, but they always are. Jacob would not have had his ankle. That's a story. I drive that home. It's real. Even though we live here, but sometimes you know, anywhere we go, people know our kid. We're in, in our home place, but we're not always home. Okay. It does transfer, like if we're on vacation, right? Even though our, our yeah, home state is a resident okay. of the state. Okay, so then, okay, okay. so if we're on vacation, yeah. not like in the state of Florida where their case was in Boca, but that triggered, I'm like, what if we're in no, New York? It's, it's, so okay. if you're a resident of that state. Okay, um, just on so, vacation. But before someone turns 18, a lot of times we like to start the paperwork and get ready to go because when that you know, the child turns 18, we're ready to go. 
So usually we want to say, please, you know, come. Well, you know, okay. But I can't I literally, you know, you're you're the parent, you're the natural guardian. I can't comment on to why some doctor's offices do what they do. Um, but you're the parent, you're the natural guardian. Um okay. yes. So the court hearing does not happen until after they turn 18. Um, it can be a little before. I mean, we usually like to be, you know, kind of tonight it, yeah. you know, so that works because it does take a little bit. When I say a month, I mean, it's, you know, kind of, you know, a two month ish kind of approach. Um, but we can get this done, you know, right at that time. Try to do it right around that time. Any other questions? Yes. Um, is Reform taking on new clients? And what is your? Like, what is the process of like the transfer to you? And um, yes, um, I, I, sorry. Any, any other questions? Yes, I just wanted to say my case, my son has a lot of somebody's high functioning, he was able to go. To the so, I knew with his doctors and everything else, he could sign, but uh, he also signed what the other sheet that. I'm able to be communicating and get all the information, talk to doctors, talk to the teachers at college, all this stuff. And I know I'm trying to figure out I need to do cognition because there's other things coming up. Um, so because the same thing, I'm still advocating medicine, the pills, stuff like that. Um, so but if they understand some stuff, we have time to I understand better to do that. That's where like advocacy would be more sex, right? Like you can make a lot of informed right, decisions. Right, right. And again, you know, I mean, I've seen it many times, times similar. Well, at least I've heard the story, the same thing. You know, where the again when they're 18, you know, they won't, they will not, will not. And then even if it was not lightly in their best interest yeah. to refuse the medical treatment, doctors' hands are tied. Yes. It's so important that you know have the guardianship. All right, yes. Thanks for, take, thanks for taking the question. But in our particular case, our child is still a minor. He's 14, 15 in July. So we can't do the special, we can't set up the trust yet. So we're trying to get it. Yeah, he means he can't set up uh, a, the uh, guardianship. Yes. Yes. Correct. But, but we he's can, planning you can do now. Okay, that was my question. So we, we can and should start that process Absolutely. now. Absolutely, we should. Okay. Absolutely. okay. And we can set up a special needs trust, uh, like yeah. an able account and all that stuff. We can start all that process now, and Absolutely. we should. Absolutely. Yes. No. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, the guardianships are for when they turn eighteen. But on the estate planning side and special needs trusts and things like that, now's the time to do it. The, the other question is: so far as the guardianship, it has to be reviewed by the court once a year. Yes. What does that look like? Do you just take the take it to the clerk of courts and they? No, we file again. We file everything's filed. We file um, the again the annual plan um, and the accounting. So that gets filed every single year. So certain, certain documents that we are required to file. Every year. If you get waived for like he will only have either SSI or SSDI or whatever. However, we get there, he will only ever have that, and that gets waived for the first year. Is that permanently waived? Based permanently okay. waived unless there's and again unless there's circumstances that um, you know he gets he gets money or something like that we would have to then change the circumstance. Um, but no, the plan itself will always have to be filed with the court because again that's what you know what you're doing to take care of the individual. That will always be um, required. It's just the accounting piece may not under the circumstances. Yeah, all right. Okay. 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 Sorry, maybe another state question. If there's already been a finding of incapacity in the establishment of a conservatorship in another state, will that likely be waived in a Florida proceeding that's already established? One. Second, will the Florida court initiate a guardianship proceeding if the individual is already under an out of state conservatorship? They, the other state still has jurisdiction. So um, again, we have to follow the process here in the state of Florida right. um, because there are certain requirements that the state may not do. I don't know if they do a criminal check and all those kind of things. So there are certain things that we do follow our procedures here in, here in Florida. And right. follow. Speaking specifically to the, to the finding of incapacity. Mm -hmm. Again, our no. process is different than other states. 
And so, um, you know, it, again, we have to follow our procedure. Cool. We, yes. have, we have a question in the chat, so I'm just going to go to the virtual one. It's kind of a two part from Maria. Does the POA, in fact, have to be updated yearly and who can be named as successors? A power of attorney does not need to be updated every year. Um, again, um, as far as successors, we can name a trusted family member, whoever. I mean, again, it, whoever we trust to uh, make financial decisions. Oh. Yes. Does your firm handle the if, if a trust is enacted? Mm -hmm. Does your firm handle the finances or does, does your firm have an account that will assist with the expenses incurred if like our family member is trying to take finances and see what's applicable to use for their adult child? Um, okay, it depends on the side. Okay, so if someone had set up a special needs trust and um, the ex, so where we come involved is if we're named as a trustee or we're serving in that capacity and we're involved in the matter. Um, we're also involved if the trustee has hired us to do ongoing trust administration. So in a situation where there is an irrevocable trust or a special needs trust that has been created under certain requirements in annual accounting and different notice requirements. So we have been engaged in those things, yes. I'm not sure what the difference is by revocable and irrevocable. But revocable trust just means it can be changed and you maintain control of it. Um, so a lot of times, um, again, revocable trust, it's typically kind of like a fancy will. That's what everybody should have in place. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you can set up a trust inside of revocable trust, um, a special needs trust. So if something happened to the individual and they passed away, that trust turns to an irrevocable trust, cannot be taken. And that's the special needs trust that's inside that revocable trust. The revocable cannot be changed, revocable can't be changed. That's your question. Mm -hmm. One more question. How does the, how does the, I guess now learning it now, revocable trust, but the, the, um, when you have a special needs trust and let's say it's funded to, per, to shield that income so that your uh, ward essentially can get SSI and SDI and all that, how does that then help them? Going forward, because the you know the parents have passed away, and now it's become you know the special needs trust is essentially activated. Then how does the, the guardian or whomever is uh, taking care of that special needs trust and directing those funds? Mm -hmm. That doesn't does that affect the amount of income that they can that they can get through these government programs? So, generally speaking, you have the guardian because the guardian is taking care of the person. And then you have the special needs trust. You have a trustee under that. Um, again, the special needs trust in a situation where the parents have passed away, um, that trustee usually communicates with that guardian to determine what that um, individual needs. So if there are needing more therapies that is not covered under SSI or Social Security, that's what I'm saying. That trust is designed to supplement the government benefits. So if he needs a new computer or something, uh, you know, uh, whatever, that trust can be used to um, provide those extra extra things that the, the child would need to use. And so again, it usually becomes like a communication between the guardian, which could be the same first guardian and a trustee to determine what is in the best interest. All right. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I just everyone just joined me and thank you. And uh, we're going to send a survey out after uh, this uh, family forum, and we'll also ask for your input on the and feedback on today's presentation, but also suggestions for future uh, presentations. Sounds like that's a good one. might be one of them. So um, we, we really we look forward to that feedback. We want to make sure that these forums are truly valuable um, and helpful to, to our families and caregivers. Um, and then we'll also be sending a link to the video uh, from today's. So, uh, and also another thank you to the Collar Community Foundation, not only for letting us use this room, but for their um, ongoing tremendous support of Star Building and our mission and our work. So, thank you all very, very much. And, um, thank you.